All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here with us tonight. My name is Roseanne Santos. I am the Director of Alumni Engagement at John Jay College, and I am so happy to see all of you here. This evening, I want to welcome alum Randy Brathwaite, who graduated in 2004. He is certified in anti-money laundering in the corporate sector, and he's an attorney. And he is going to really give you some insider information on how to stand out above the crowd. You want to make sure your resume is shining bright on the stack of the hiring manager's desk. And you are going to leave here tonight with some substantial tools to help that happen. So without further ado, I will let Randy shine and introduce to you to him this evening. Randy, the floor is yours. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Roseanne. And thank you, John Jay College of Criminal Justice for this opportunity to share, you know, the tips I've learned over the last 10 to 12 years, um, being a professional in New York, traversing from Barbados to Michigan and working in different fields. It's a pleasure to see you all. And for those I can't see, it's a pleasure that you are able to join us this evening. So without further ado, as I like to begin, could we just first do a very good grounding exercise to get ourselves started? The reason why is that we're gonna go into a lot of information. If I am going too fast, please let us know in the chat. And if there are any questions, please let us know in the chat so that as we go through each particular section, you'll be able to provide um, questions and I'll be able to provide answers at the end of each section. So let's get grounded. Let's do a quick 10 second, good posture, push yourself up, stand up tall, take a big deep breath in with me, two seconds and exhale. Okay, great. Now let's jump into it. You can do anything you want to achieve. All you have to do and not limited to these particular things. You need to be focused, determined, consistent, build your team and learn the playing field. This evening, we're gonna focus on some particular areas of very significant importance. A three-day career transformation strategy, a 2020 job search plan, and then the 10 questions you should ask any recruiter, hiring manager, or employee with regard to a position you're seeking to acquire. Each section is gonna be 10 minutes and I am turning on my timer to make sure I stay on time. And we are gonna hit these particular areas to make sure that we are really going to get you some substantive information to help you with your job transformation strategy. And notice I call it job transformation strategy or career transformation, because this is your career and this is your ability to set your path in your life and how you want it to be. So let's begin. Get your notepad, get your book, get your phone. Let's go. Three day career transformation strategy. Day one, materials. Very important in your career transformation process. Everyone thinks they know all the things that they're supposed to have when they go to look for the next position. But what I've found is that there's some very crucial pieces of career material that you need to have in your arsenal. And the first thing you need to start with before you do anything, you need to go to Excel. And you need to go to Excel and you need to create a company tracking chart. That is number one, because we are going to track the companies you apply to, the people who you speak to, where you're gonna have a connection and other essential elements as we go further on into this evening. The next thing, number two, target companies. I like the idea of target companies. Why does it always have to be about what skills they want? Why can't it be about what skills you have and where you want to work? It's about finding the right place for you. And what I'm going to recommend is that you create a 10 company chart of companies that you're interested in. Next 
Next thing, number three, a resume. Everyone knows they have to have a resume, but I got some crucial information for you. If you're zero to three years out, your resume should be one page. If you're five to 10 years out, two pages. And if you're 10 to 15 years plus, say three pages. Give yourself those kind of limits to keep within the parameters of the applicant tracking system. Also, when a rec recruiter actually sees your resume, do you think they have time to be reading five pages of your resume? I don't think so. So let's not do it. Let's just get to the point and let them know why you are the superstar that you are. The next crucial item a lot of people sometimes don't have that I actually worked on a couple of times and transformed for myself, you need to have yourself a professional profile. What is a professional profile? A professional profile has your picture, your address, your email, but then it has some highlights of what you've done, where you've worked, and the things that you do. You keep it engaging, you keep it interesting, you keep it fun, but you keep it relevant to highlighting the specific skills that you have. Number five, professional and personal references. Now you think you know people and you hope that the people that you know are gonna help you. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but you need to have to actually, you actually need to have a one page document, which is actually consisted of two to three professional references and two personal references. People that you know have your back and can talk about your character and why you are the best person for a particular position. Number six, technical knowledge document. A technical knowledge document is basically a Word document which has skills and programs. Ability, I got certificates in this thing. This is what you need to show people. I can do Microsoft Word, I can do PowerPoint, I can do Excel, I can do MS-DOS, I can do JavaScript. All the systems that you know that you can work in, put it in a document and actually have it when you submit your documents to show people, hey, not only do I talk about it, I know these things. Number seven, crucial, crucial thing that I'm recommending for anyone that's doing virtual interviews or any kind of interviews online your 60 second pitch video, who you are, what you do, and why you're a good candidate for the role. You wanna distinguish yourself in the marketplace and I find the 60 second pitch to be a fantastic place to start. And then you need to identify, and this is number eight, the top three professional things you know you are 100% good at. I mean, you sleep it, eat it, breathe it. You can close your eyes like me right now and talk about it like anybody's business. You need to know what those three things are because they will differentiate you in the market and make sure that when you're having those very difficult conversations in your interview, you can always circle back to those three core things. So that is what you need to do for day one. And that's just day one. Let's jump back now to day two. Day two, your digital presence. Some people might not be using certain platforms. I recommend that you do because most recruiters research you on your digital platforms. So tonight, if you have not done it, I recommend that you go clean up all your social media profiles that are not restricted specifically to your very, 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 very close friends. Next, the second thing you're gonna do, because by the time you did finish this evening, you're gonna have all the tools you're gonna need to be very aggressive in your job search approach or your career transformations approach is that you're going to get a LinkedIn premium membership and use that free 30 day trial. The reason why you're gonna use that trial is because we're gonna go something called the LinkedIn methodology. You ready? This is number three on day two, LinkedIn connections methodology. You need to search LinkedIn to determine which contacts of your contacts work at your target companies. Remember I mentioned that target company list? So you should have that. You're gonna message your direct contact to ask them to an introduction for the person who works at the firm or company you're interested in. You are not going to send any direct LinkedIn request to a person 
you do not have a contact to. The reason why is this twofold. One, LinkedIn will ban you from doing it, number one. And two, most people who don't know you or have a connection to you directly won't do, won't receive something that I'm going to show you to do. You're going to message your direct contact and ask them for the connection. And the second part of it is that you're going to ask your connection to do a virtual introduction for you. What this does is that you're leveraging their connection to the person and their credibility for yourself. And you know why they're going to do it? Because they actually like you and they're on your team. And guess who, who you want on your team? People like that. And it's also going to make you realize who's not on your team. Because some people you think might be on your team. Unfortunately, they might not be on your team. And you want good people on your team. When you do the connection request with your contact, you're going to have a list of at least minimum, no more, don't go too crazy, 10 questions for the connection you're being introduced to. But you're going to be different when you do this part. You're going to be asking them about, number one, what they do, their role, and their experiences. And you're going to ask them for a 30-second call, a 30-minute call, or 15-minute call after to have a further conversation, or if they're more comfortable, ask them for a Zoom meeting for 10 minutes. That's it. But note, asterisk, asterisk, note, note, this is not the phase where you're going to be asking people for a job. We're not there yet. You don't know them and they don't know you. You gotta build the relationship because what we're doing is relationship building. Next, let your contact know about your interests and what you learned about the company, and then tell them thank you so much for their time, and then that's it. The third part of the three-day process, and this is the most crucial part of the three-day process, we're gonna do something called people intelligence gathering. What we're gonna do is this. You're gonna make a list of the top 20 people that you know that are connected to the area that you're interested in. You're going to call them personally and ask them for their help with regard to reaching your target company. And then you're going to pre-draft pre questions that you're gonna ask anyone that they're able to connect you to. And then you're gonna state the three things you're good at to these 20 people you call. You know why? These 20 people are gonna to start to form your team. And you want to let them know the three things, like I told you that you're good at. You know why? Because you're gonna volunteer your time and your energy to help them. So you tell the person, listen, I'm looking for a position in X company to do this role. However, just to let you know, I'm good at information technology, I design websites, and I'm great in organizational skills. So if you need that stuff, call me. I'm the person you need to come to. That makes you an asset. And now you're not just asking for something, you're giving something in return. So if you got the time and you got the bandwidth, you can actually help that person when something comes up. Your relationship building as you're going forward. Don't skip that step. Second, alumni groups. Are you functioning in your alumni group? Are you a participant in events with your alumni group? If you aren't, you're missing a fantastic resource. Oh, there's my timer, 10 minutes. I'm gonna let it go for two seconds. One, you gotta be part of your alumni groups. They're an invaluable resource for connections. And people normally connect with people easier when they see they've want, went to the specific school or university. And number two, you attend events like this. So you get information and resources and connections for people who can actually help you out, who are willing to give their time to give back to helping you on your career journey. And number three, don't sleep on it, professional organizations. If you're in a career path and you cannot tell me what are the two top professional organizations in your group, it doesn't look good. If you don't attend the virtual events for your professional organization in the career path you're in, it doesn't look good. And even if there's a fee to join a particular group, most of the time as a student, it's waived the first year. And if you're not a student and you're a professional and you're saying, okay, that fee might be too high, 
email the secretary of the group or the treasurer and tell them, listen, I'm looking to mobilize my career. I'm having some difficulty. Can you give me a six month or one year membership until I'm able to get back on my feet? More than likely, they will give you access to the group because they want to see you become a productive member of the group. And when you do join the group, not only just join as a regular member, join a committee. I see one of my contacts on here, Kevin. The Financial Literacy Committee of NABA I joined because I wanted to have more information about financial liter literacy. I just want to learn how to handle my money. Fantastic organization. Net worth has increased at least 10% in COVID. So that's the way you are able to build those relationships with a financial literacy group. And I'm doing a presentation for them coming up on property purchasing. So I learned something when I was in the group. So I gave back something to the group. That's the way that you build relationships in the groups that you're a part of. So that's my three-day career transformation process. So let's recap. You ready? In case you missed it, let's go back to the beginning. Day one, materials. Day two, digital presence. Notice I use LinkedIn. I did not use Facebook or Instagram. Day three, people intelligence. It is the key. You need to know who is on your team. Now, let's jump into any questions right now. Roseanne, any questions? Let's do two minutes of questions if you have any, so we can just answer some questions. All yours. No questions yet, but you mentioned NABA. So can you just tell people what that is? National Association of Black Accountants, New York. I'm not an accountant. What are you doing there? Trying to get some information on how to deal with my money. That's what I was trying to do. So I join association based on my need and I join associations where I feel I can actually help them too give and take. But what I started to realize is that I joined association because I actually had a genuine interest in what they do. I always was fascinated by accountants and what they do and the work that they perform and why they're the gatekeepers for so many people's financial future. So what I did is I joined, joined as a member, paid the fee, attended the event, they had a financial literacy group. And I was like, look, I need to get paid. I need to pay off my student loans. Somebody here needs to know how to do that. Guess what? I met people in the group who were coaching me on how to pay off my student loans. And they were giving me strategies on investing. They've given me strategies on options trading. They've given me strategies on what we like to call side hustles. We had a workshop with regard to taxation. I came out of school on my first job, I paid $40,000 in taxes for the first year. I went to my accountant and he said, that's what you pay. I changed my accountants the next year and then I paid $20,000 in taxes. You need to know how your money works. So the accountants know what's going on. So that's how I like to utilize joining organizations. And another association I, I, I am always working with, the National Black, the National Black MBA Association, New York chapter, shout out to Chuck, always giving me guide guidance on business. Thank you. There's one more question. Can we hit, do you mind? Do we have time? Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, we'll take this one more and then you can go your, to your second part. Trent Santer, with re, this is the person asking, with regard to your 60 second pitch, do you have a set format or structure or formula? How can I, number one, I either do two, there are two pitches I do. The first one is the, how can I help you? And the second pitch is who I am. So the how can I help you is that I would normally start by saying, I do these things that will benefit you. And that's normally because I know the person or the people or the group I will be talking to. So I list the three things that I know that they need or they want. When I start with that, that's it. People want what they need. People want what they want. So when you give it, tell them that you can do certain things, that's it. And then the conversation flows from there. The second one is like, I keep it very short. 
I always stay where I'm from, Barbados. I always talk about what I do currently. I always talk about what I can help people with and why I'm a good connection to have. That's it. And I think it draws in people and it connects people to you so that they understand, hey, this guy does these things. He's from this place. Oh, I might connect with him because he might be a good contact for X, Y, and Z. So that's the way I do my 60 second pitches to build my relationship. Thank you. So it's back to you, Randy. Those are all the questions. Okay, perfect. Section two, is everyone with me? Nod if you're with me. Let's do some head nods. Nods if you're with me. All right, great. See those head nods. Maria, I see you. Good, good, good. Megan, I see you. Good, good, good. All right. So here we go. The 2020 job search strategy. 2020. This is a year we will not forget. Number one, narrow down the list of the five target companies utilizing this tracker that we talked about in part one. So now we're down to five. Now, as I told you, talk, start with 10. Now we're down to five. Now you're gonna identify two positions in that target company that you're interested in. Number three, you're gonna determine the salary range of the roles. Notice I say salary range, not how much money it specifically is gonna be paid, but the range. And the reason why that's going to be important is going to come up later. Now, number four, and very critical, you got your resume. You think your resume is fantastic. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But guess what? Your resume might not be suited for the two roles that you actually found. So you know what you're going to do? You're going to adjust your resume using the 10 keywords that you have noticed at the two companies in the resume profile. Notice what I say, 10 keywords. Now in every, every recruiter that posts roles use terms of art specific to that particular role. If you're in the industry, you're gonna know what those terms of art should be and what they are that you put in your resume. The applicant tracking system will literally not provide your resume to a recruiter if you're missing terms of art. People talk about it, but nobody actually explains how many particular, particular words you should have. I normally go with 10. And the reason I go with 10 and not 20 or 30 is that when the recruiter sees your resume, once the system spits it out, if you've rewritten what they put in the post that they wrote, that's a no-go. And people have done that to see if the system works. And guess what people say? Yeah, it does work. Now, they're never gonna look at you again. So you don't wanna be that person. So I say 10, and you know the terms of arts for your field, and you know that the terms of arts in your area. And you know another way that you can figure out the terms of art? If you are part of your alumni group, or if you are part of your professional networking group, because people will tell you what words are the lingo in their industry. Randy, are Next you saying you terms of art, A-R-T? I just want to make terms sure. Terms of art. Right. Yeah, terms of okay. art. Like, for example, in my area, AML, right? If you don't have anything in your resume related to know your customer, I might not say you've ever done AML because that's a term that we always use in the space, KYC. That's a, just a term that everyone in the space knows that, that practices or works in this area. So, you need to know the specific terms for your industry, for the position that you're looking for to use it in your resume. The next thing that you need to do, you gotta draft the cover letter. You know why? And I know like for me, sometimes a cover letter is like, okay, why do I really need to do this thing? Well, the truth is this, a cover letter is important because it differentiates you from the other candidates that are coming through the door. It makes you look like you have an actual genuine interest in that target firm. But you know what we're gonna do? Remember I told you before, you create a cover letter generally, and then you just mix it up for the company that you wanna use it for. So you got a template and then you just adjust it. So you're not recreating the wheels. I like to add rims, that's it. Next, you gotta utilize the network tracker contact. 
from the three day transformation strategy. So we're at number six. The network tracker strategy allows you because you've now narrowed down the companies, you know what companies you're interested in, you know what positions you're interested in. Now you go to your tracker to connect with those people. And this is where you start to have those conversations. You need to go to the connections and you need to ask them specific questions about the specific role. And if they don't know the role, and they refer everyone. you to somebody else to talk about the role itself. And then ask your contact to do something really unique. You know what you're going to ask your contact to do in the company? Share your professional profile with the HR recruiter in the firm, not your resume. You know why? Because we want to see the best you in front of them. And when the best you is there, guess what? They're going to be intrigued to see who is this person that just sent me a professional profile that looks so well drafted. And then when that professional profile goes into the system to that HR contact, you just ask them for 15 minutes. Just want to have a quick 15 minute conversation at their leisure, just to talk about some specific question we're about to get into. So that is the 2020 job search strategy specific to making the progress that you need to make. All right, so let's pause and do our two minute questions if we have any. We do have two questions. Venusa Scarlett asks, what advice would you give to a mid-level professional who had a side hustle, but is still very invested in elevating their career. For example, HR professional who is also a wedding planner, how do you ensure you don't come across as someone who doesn't have a clear career path? I consider you an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. And I like it because guess what? I don't ever say anyone should depend on one income source. So what I say is that you take the skill sets that you have learned from your HR role and your wedding planning role, which is a lot of logistics, which is a lot of people management, which is a lot of time management, relationship building, bride and groom mitigation of risk. You take those skill sets in those, think of it in that particular way and then combine them for the next role that you want to see yourself in. And that's why I say, look at target companies that have the particular roles that you're actually interested in. And then you go after those type of roles. So you got HR, you got wedding planning. So to me, you can be part of operational logistics for Fortune 500 company, or you can be the senior executive at a multinational firm with various contacts around the world in one product group. That's the kind of ways I would think about that particular, those particular skill sets. But I would not bring up, notice what I'm gonna say, I would not bring up the side hustle in a corporate interview because side hustles, as you know, have restrictions in certain, in certain corporations because of the fact that it takes away time from the work that you might have to do inside the firm. So I would say that you make sure you determine what kind of firm you're gonna be interested um, speaking to and what are their parameters and how, you, guess what? Guess how you're gonna know that before you get there? You'd have talked to your contacts in the firm to know. Good. And I would say someone who does um, wedding planning has a keen eye for detail. So that's definitely one. Um, we have a question from Rachel Frazier. What is your advice for someone who is still trying to figure out their career path when applying for jobs? That's why I brought up the first point of, ask yourself the question, what are you really good at? No, seriously, have, has anyone ever done that? Ask yourself, what are, you, what are you really good at? What are you actually good at? What can you actually do? Write those three things down and then look at careers that fall within the spectra of those particular areas. I've actually done a Google search. This word plus this word plus this word plus job, just to see what comes up. And then you get a whole list of different careers and roles and things that match those particular phrases. 
And then I get an idea of where to start looking. So I would say determine first the three things you're good at. Then once you determine those things, get those 20 people and have a conversation with them. Tell them, hey, I'm good at these things. Where do you think I can position myself if I'm looking for a position? Is there any career path that you think kind of fits this? Get their feedback. Then you go to Google. Google, you're my friend. Don't, look, don't fail me now. Enter those phrases and then put them together. And then you'll start to see which kind of careers come up. And also, don't ever forget the Department of Labor and Statistics has a massive Rolodex list of all careers in the United States. You can actually go there and look at different careers and it actually lists what are the skill sets required in those careers. I've actually used it when I was looking up something on um, helping a person with their career path. They were in cybersecurity and intelligence. So I wanted to see actually what does it, what is it, what does that even mean? And what are the skill sets you need to have to be successful in that? So that's where I was able to go and look up that information to help them out. The chat is blowing up, Randy. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna ask you the three questions that are in the chat and you can determine if they make sense right now or if you wanna wait till later. Is that okay? If you're gonna answer it in the next section. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, oh. that works. So Bianca Hales, how can you showcase your worthy investment when you plan to go to law school or graduate school in approximately a year? Jeremiah, okay. oh, I was gonna tell you the rest of them, but go ahead. Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Jeremiah Hot, how is genuine interest conveyed in a conversation in an increasingly digital world? which may happen over text or direct messages. Any tips? How can you apply to jobs and be able to find a career, but you are so confused? I apply to so many jobs on Indeed, but I'm passed over or someone for someone or someone else gets the job interview. Um, and then last, what advice do you have to a person interested in AML with a master's degree and a certificate in organized crime, but no experience? And then how to structure a cover letter. So it runs the gamut. So I wanted to, you know, you could probably combine some of those responses or maybe you're gonna hit it in the next section. Okay, I'll, I would say that I wanna answer each of them individually. Okay. And we can ask it, cause each of them are fantastic questions. And I totally under, I can feel the, I can feel where they're coming from. So I want to answer each of them individually. So we okay. should just do all of them at the end because we're, okay. we're on time. So we'll be able to get to every individual question that was asked. Sounds and good. I, and I could even knock off one right now with regard to how do you show your genuine interest right now while you're doing things virtually like this. It's very hard via text and telephone sometimes to come across to show your interest and your eagerness because I can't read you. You can't, I can see Megan right here. I can see Megan's reaction. I can see when she smiles. I can see when she's like, I don't know about that. I can see when she's like, yay, that's really good. You see like, no, she's laughing. So when you, you know, Bianca's there. I can see Bianca just smiled when we, when I just said that. So it's very hard to do this by a text and by a phone. So I think it's good to have those video conferences, but also via phone, somebody explained to me, listen to the breaks the person makes and try to use that to try to gauge their reaction to certain things. I don't like the guessing game. I've tried it a little bit, but I find it's very difficult because what you might be guessing the person is breaking on, they might just be chewing and you're like, um, so was that a good break or a bad break? So I would say utilize video, and sometimes video, I try to tell people, video does not have to be perfect. It's about making the connection, you know? So when Cynthia's here, I can see Cynthia, you know? She's taking the time to be here. So I wanna see her and have that kind of connection with her immediately. Take the time to do the videos. I think it's gonna save you a lot because you can message a thousand people and they might not be able to come back. But, you know, I've had conversations with people and I find that having the video helps, especially because I can tell sometimes what's stressing them and, and how they feel about the kind of reaction that I'm giving to them. So I'm gonna just knock that one immediately out, use video. Even if it's for five minutes, 
try to use video so you can have that personal interaction with the person. All right, so here is the fun part now. Last section. You guys ready? 10 questions you should be asking recruiters, ma recruiters, managers, and hiring managers. And we are at 6.36 with time. So here we go. Let's start with the hiring managers. Actually, you know what? Let's start with the recruiters because that's who you're gonna really interact with first. Number one, why is this position open? Number two, is this a new role or a backfilling role? Number three, is there any person internally you're considering? Number four, how long has this been, how long has this position been open? Number five, in a nutshell, what are you really looking for to hire a candidate? Number Ray, six. Can you slow down just a little bit? And for no everyone's problem. benefit, we are recording the session and we'll send it out. But Randy, if you could just slow down a little tiny bit. Thank you. All right, no problem. Number six. How is the recruiter sourcing their candidates? Number seven. How many rounds of interviews are they? Number eight. What are the top three challenges for the role? Number nine, in terms of salary, do you have a general range in mind for this particular position? And number 10, how quickly must you fill this role? Those are my top 10 questions for recruiters. And the reason why I ask these questions of recruiters is because this is called intelligence gathering. I'm, number one, I'm gonna know if this recruiter is a good recruiter and what kind of relationship they have with the hiring team that they're working with. I'm also gonna be able to determine who's my competition. What am I up against? I'm gonna be able to get an idea with regard to, is this position even worth it? Are they paying enough for this work? I'm going to know, do you need to get this position hired really quickly? Meaning that you're going to really, really be interested in me. And I want to know how many people I'm going to interview with because every series of rungs of interview is very different. And you must understand how many rungs you are going to be approached with and how many people are going to be in each rung because you don't want to get into an interview thinking this is a one shot deal. And then you find out it is wrong one of nine for the position that you're going after, which is going to take you like five months to even get through, to even see if you get a position and they don't want to tell you the salary. And then you get to the end and you're like, all of this for that. No, cut it out in the beginning. I see Kevin is like, yep, that's right. You want to be able to deal with these things. Maria's, Maria's smirking right there. I see Giuseppe's like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. You know you want to really ask these questions, but it's better for you to ask them early on because if you do, you're going to set yourself up. And it's better to ask them of the recruiter too. The reason why is that I find a good recruiter, if you're going to build a relationship with a recruiter or recruiting team, you want to have that kind of relationship early on to let them realize that I understand how this game is played. So I want to make sure that I'm putting myself in the best position in this game. So that when things really get thick, I can really come to you and ask you some hard questions. Because if they can't ask these hard questions now, it's going to be very difficult for them to ask those hard questions later. So that's the recruiters. Let's go to the hiring manager. Now, the hiring manager approach is very different. You know why? This might be your future boss. <laughs> so you want to make sure you use a little bit of tack and guile here, but you want to really understand the kind of person you might have to work with. First question, number one, how long have you been working with the company? Number two, why did you decide to work here? 
Number three, is the team collaborative? Number four, what is your team known for? Do they execute well? Are they known for being innovators or strategists? Number five, what are the best strengths of your team? Number six, what are the volumes like in your business? Number seven, do you think it is essential for the team to remain in the tri-state area? If you say yes, then why? Number eight, when was the last time senior management acknowledged your team for the work that they do? Number nine, do you feel that your year end bonus for your team is adequate for the level of work that you guys perform? And number 10, do you feel that the salary increases for your team are adequate for this team and the work that they perform? That's my top 10 question for managers. So as you can see there, I'm asking financial questions in a very kind of specific general way. I'm asking questions around how does the senior management view the team itself? AKA, is this team valuable? If you live in a particular state, you wanna make sure that the team isn't moving. So you better make sure you ask the question, why would it be relevant for you to be where you are? And then you wanna to get to know the hiring manager. Why did he even choose this firm? Why is he still working here? Does he really like it? He might not say, but the question will get you a response to get you to gauge, is this person happy in their role? Or is this person just doing this because they have to? It makes a difference in how they're gonna manage you. So those are the kind of questions that I like to ask hiring manager, but I really wanna know what it is, what is this team really known for and what kind of volumes they deal with? Because if I'm gonna be getting into a job where I'm gonna be working from nine to nine, you better make sure that you're gonna be paying me from nine to nine, probably 10 and 11 and 12, because it's called bonus. So you better make sure the parameters of what you're getting yourself into. And these are questions, the way that I've drafted them, that if you ask them, they're very general enough to not be offensive, but good enough that the person realize that you're a strategist. And if you're a strategist, guess what I want on my team? That kind of person. Wow, that was impressive. Thank you. You're so welcome. I do Got want- one more. Oh, there's one more section. Okay, so there are a couple of questions relevant to the section you just went over. Do you want those now or you wanna wait? Uh, let's wait, let's wait. Okay. We got the last section for you guys. Employees. I love talking to employees. Employees are not your friend. Okay. They're your potential allies. So we're going to approach employees a little bit different. Question number one. Same thing. How long have you been working with the company? Number two. What motivated you? to join this group. Number three, is the team collaborative? Number four, does the manager work with the team on professional development opportunities? Number five, when is the last time someone in your group received a promotion? Number six, when was the last time a person in your group was promoted to, po to potentially take a professional development course? Number seven, do you feel the year and bonus 
in this team is adequate for the level of work you perform? Number eight, do you feel that your salary increases are adequate for the work that you do? Number nine, are you acknowledged for the work that you do? And you, number 10, final one. Do you feel the team is acknowledged for the work that it does? These are the kind of questions you ask an employee sitting in a room because you wanna have a sense of how that person feels about their role and never ever get into an interview and not ask everyone in the room at least two questions because everyone might have a vote and they do normally have a vote on you when it comes to being a member of a particular team. Whether you like it or not, there's all of them is gonna have, everyone's gonna have an opinion. Depends on how the hiring manager feels, they might take it or not, but guarantee you, you want everyone to see you there as the person that they can see themselves working with every day for however long you're gonna be with that team. This is the likability factor. This is the, I get to see part of your personality factor. But the fact that you acknowledge every single person in that room, they're gonna remember that substantially compared to other candidates because some candidates will go in and focus on one person in the room that they think is the dominant player and not realize this is like chess. There's some other players in that room also too. So that is the end of that section. And I just wanted to say that this is your career journey. I wanna thank you all for your time. And this is the way that I would recommend you go about doing these things to get to where you want to get to. But do not sleep on it. Do them efficiently and effectively, back to back to back, to make sure that you give yourself a sense of timing and purpose to move forward. Don't get comfortable. Do them urgently. Urgency allows you to create momentum. Momentum puts you on a path. The path is your career success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Oh my goodness, that was excellent. Someone said you dropped some big gems and that's, that's absolutely true. Oh, what if, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions. So you may not have time or they're like, they're shuffling you along to an, another question, another event or another set of people. Um, do you just do what you can? Do you pick the top five? Are these in any order? I, I group them in segments. The reason why is because you wanna go through finances. You wanna talk about personal interaction. You wanna know about the company itself and how the company treats it people. So those are the three categories that I normally group them into so that when you're asking these questions, you can get, get that kind of feedback. And you know what? I like to keep them in order because what happens is that as you go through several rounds of interviews, you'll be able to collect that data to use for yourself to review, to determine how you want to deal with that particular company. Okay, that makes sense. So I think we're gonna go back to the questions from earlier that you say you wanted to come to the end. Oh, perfect, um, yes. Unless you have another segment that you wanna get into, otherwise we can go deep into the Q&A. Well, I have some information I can give to individuals right now if that helps them so that later on in case we run out of time. Sure, do you want us to on put it in the chat? Yeah, like I could just tell everyone right now, on, on October 27th from 6 p.m. at 6 p.m., the National Black MBA Association New York chapter has a resume development one hour free session as well as internship opportunities. So I'm gonna share that with Roseanne so that she can share that with you guys. Um, there's also a virtual career fair on Thursday, November 5th. That's coming up. And that 
those career fairs, I recommend people attend after you've done these things. And the reason why is that you would be in a position to get to work with, to look at the companies that are recruiting and actually see a lot of the open roles, but more importantly, the recruiters attend the virtual career fairs. And that's where you start to do the relationship building with the recruiters directly. That's on November 5th. And then the National Association of Black Accountants New York chapter has an event on October 19th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. titled Starting and Building Your Career in a Virtual World. So I would recommend that you look up that organization, email them, ask them about joining. If you're a student, ask them about joining and connect with them because these are organizations that are really doing really great work in the community, in the virtually to allow you to position yourself to have those opportunities. And you can actually see all the firms that they're already connected to that you can actually find opportunities with those particular firms. So I wanted to give you guys, you know, those resources and then something from this chat, I would like everyone to do. It's good to have something I call an accountability partner. And you have to start relationship building. And if you're a person who doesn't know anyone who was like me coming from Barbados, landing, as I would call it, in New York with zero connections, you have to be able to connect with new people to build those relationships. A good place to start is here. I recommend that each person message another person and connect with them to start building their team. This is the easiest way to do it. I am a person, hey, I don't, I'm looking to connect. Are you looking to connect? That's it. They say yes, they say no. But at least you start the process of practicing to do this because the biggest thing about networking is that you're gonna get a lot of no's or a lot of yeses who really don't know in terms of they don't connect with you. They don't follow up, they don't follow through. So if you're on a journey and that person is on the same career transformation strategy journey, I think this is a good resource for you to do. And for those of you who are on the phone who can't see, I recommend you connect with Roseanne because this is where we call this the hub and spoke. Consider this your hub and John Jay as a hub for you to connect with so you can share your information and share your resources and when they have something, they can share it with you also. So share your email, connect with them and tell them, hey, I don't, I'm looking to make a connection with a person who was doing the same thing. And this is where you gotta have LinkedIn. But remember how I said about using LinkedIn. Don't just send a connection request. They don't know you. You gotta build that relationship. Use the premium membership and then you send them an email in LinkedIn for free. Okay, so let's jump into questions. All right, sounds good. Question number one, how can you showcase your worth, the investment to an employer when you already have plans to go to law school or graduate school in about a year? Several organizations pay for you to go to law school or graduate school. They'll pay your tuition. They'll pay, I know the firm I work for, they pay, for you to be in school. So you can go to school and work if you had to. Law school, there's a lot of people who've done it, who've gone to school and work while in school. So that's not, a, that's not a problem. You gotta find the right firm that's willing to support you in that particular venture. And a year is a, a long time from now. So if you wanna make some money, find a firm that's gonna be best positioned to help you reach the goal that you want. And then you can also take time off at firms to go do higher education and come back because then they want you as a resource and a tool in the firm. So don't ever let that stop you. Look at the firms that actually have those programs and the firms list the programs that they have related to it. So you can actually go do that. That's what I would recommend. Wonderful, thank you. So this next question I can combine with a, a question that came up later. I think they're mm -hmm. similar. How can you apply to jobs and be able to find a career, but you are confused? I applied to so many jobs on Indeed, but I'm passed over. And then someone else asked, what are some of the best sites to actually look for jobs outside of Indeed and LinkedIn? 
So I think those kind of flow together. Okay, great. First, I would say about Indeed and LinkedIn. Normally, when a job is posted on a job board, most of the time it's already gone. That's the first thing. So if, you, if no one's ever told you, I'm going to tell you now. Most of those positions are already taken or already filled and they're old. So what we found is that the resource, like I mentioned, is the people connection, human intelligence. You got to have connections in the firms who can tell you when positions first get posted or even before positions get posted. There's a, at least there's a, a statistics that says that at least approximately 60% of positions that are filled are filled by HR, con, HR individuals who have connections to referrals already that they know for the positions. So even before you even see the job, it's already gone. And then the ones that they really can't fill is because nobody had a connection that knew a connection to get them the job. And then when they do post it online, you get 3000 people for one role. Then the applicant tracking system deletes 299 of those people because of the format of your resume, the, 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 the font, People put pictures in resumes. The computer just doesn't read it and you're lost. So these systems work in that particular way. So you got to understand the, the demographics of how the system works. Another group I would recommend, I'm part of something called HR Wine and Dine. So HR Wine and Dine is a group of HR professionals who basically like wine. I like wine. So I go to the Wine and Dine with the HR people. And they tell you about different things in HR, what's going on in HR field and what they're doing, what they're seeing. But the most important thing is that they're talking about strategies. I don't, you don't have to talk about jobs, but they talk about strategies in HR. So you know how the systems work by connecting with people who actually work in the systems. So that is how you find out what's going on on the back end of the site. So when it comes to sites, the technology in LinkedIn is fantastic because if you actually draft your LinkedIn profile a specific way, the keyword searches, the recruiters are using LinkedIn to search for jobs. So instead of them having to use all these networks and all these groups or all these colleges, they're going into LinkedIn. And then they're just searching keywords. And then you get recruiters messaging you about particular, particular jobs because they found a keyword associated to your LinkedIn profile. So I recommend that you update your LinkedIn, use the keyword words from in your field in your LinkedIn, and you will start to and engage in LinkedIn, like people's posts, share posts, join a LinkedIn group that's specific to your particular business field, and then message people and get information from them with regard to how the field works so you can gather more information and use the people intelligence group. Career Builder, LinkedIn. I used to like Career Builder a lot back in the day, but I found the algorithm has changed a lot. So I, I find that LinkedIn is really pushing the narrative with regard to really connecting people. I had positions pop up in various firms for assistant general counsel, AML, director, da 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 da, da for Fortune 500 companies just because of the keywords that are in my LinkedIn profile. And you can apply online. <laughs> you just click the button and that's it. But I would never do that because I would go to one of my contacts that works for the company and ask them to go to the HR recruiter to ask them if the role is actually open or was it already filled? So I don't waste time. So that's what I would recommend for that one. Randy, could you also go to the top five companies that you've narrowed down and go to their individual sites, to their career or HR pages? Or are those, um, or is that fruitless? Not fruitless, it's just that it's going to be a challenge because you can't tell how long the role's been posted sometimes, okay. which could be a problem because sometimes they might not have cycled out the role or the HR rep is busy as they come and taken down the position. So that role might actually be, have already been filled. Plus again, you want, as I said, you want to really know what's going on with the role and if it's really hiring. So that's why people intelligence and relationships are going to matter and not only relationships to get in the job, but once you get in the job, you got to keep those relationships to be able to get promoted also. And that's the other thing that affects a lot of people. You might get in the position and not network to help you get to your next role. 
So when you're looking for your next role, you're like, do I go and apply on the website again? No, my role that I acquired, I actually was recruited through LinkedIn. That's how they found me. And I was working with another firm and the recruiter called me and I asked him, how did you find me? He's like, LinkedIn. I said, like, really? He's like, yeah, like, duh. So I was like, okay, okay thank Sounds you for letting me know. <laughs> thank you. What advice do you have to a person interested in AML, which um, is anti-money laundering, correct? Yeah, that's correct. With a, with a master's degree and a certificate in organized crime, but no experience. <clears throat> What's the master's? What's the master's in? That would be my question. A um, certificate in organized crime from which association or which organization? That's the second question. And they did join the, the the networking group for that organization that offered them the certificate. Because mm -hmm. if they didn't, they're they're underutilizing that certificate itself. Because that group should be a network that they can utilize to start to find out which kind of entry level positions they could acquire in AML. And AML positions can take the gamut, anti-money laundering itself can take, there's a lot of different paths into the field, especially at the junior level when you have no experience, but it really depends on which organization you wanna to go to and where you wanna be located. Cause I can tell you right now in some states like Florida, they're hiring a lot for AML positions in specific groups or Texas. That's another one too, where they're hiring a lot of people in specific groups for entry level positions. In New York, that might not be the same because most of the people in New York are more experienced in that particular area. So you gotta know where you're looking to go and which state you're comfortable in going into. Or if you're looking for something in New York, you gotta really connect with people who are in-house who can tell you when junior roles open up that you can look to acquire positions in network. Yeah. That's excellent advice. Uh, he received his International Crime and Justice Masters and certificate both from John Jay. Okay, perfect. So did you go on the question it would be, did you go on the, the did you go on LinkedIn and looked up everyone that has that same master's degree and find out where they're working? And did you see if you know any of them personally? And then did you ask them, hey, how is everything at where you're working and how did you get that position? And then if they say, well, I got it through X, ask them if they can help you out. And most alumni will. So you got to use the alumni network for that part. And if you just want to go to specific firms and then just try to send your resume in, I don't recommend that for AML. Because the reason why I say is that AML is very specific skill set that's very unique in terms of the parameters of what they're looking for. And although you have zero years of experience, your degree is actually a really fantastic asset for going into the field. You just gotta know which company is a good one that would accept or is hiring right now in that space. And you wanna know the fastest way to know who's hiring in that space? Ask you? No, <laughs> go look up. Go, go, to the, go to Google and see who just got hit with the largest fines for AML issues. That's who you need to go to get a job. Because guess what? They're hiring. Wow. And I'm not going to say anything other than that <laughs> that's with regard track. to who it is. <laughs> but yeah, but that's the truth. That's, in AML, that's how you know who to go to. Any firm that you see is hit with a large fine is going to be hiring because they need to have people to cover any future fines. And you know, in banking, people don't like to lose money. So they better cover it quick. So they hire really fast. And then you can go online and go on LinkedIn and look up the recruiters, like AML in that bank. And then that's how you get in. So that's the way I would do it. Go look at FinCEN website. Go look at the, and the person would know what's FinCEN, financial, uh, financial Crime Network. Go look at them and see who they just gave the biggest fines to. That's who you need to go apply to real fast because there's windows in AML. Um, it's normally like fine, hire, quiet, fine, hire, quiet, fine, hire, quiet. I've, I've noticed it like a wave like that in this field. So if you're in the field, you know that, you know, big fines, I got to fix the problem, hire, hire, hire. 
big fine, I gotta fix the problem higher. It normally goes in waves. Thank you, that's excellent. Um, any tips, you talked about the cover letter being kind of where you, where you distinguish yourself. So any tips on how to structure? A, is there such a thing as a good structured cover letter or is it unique to a profession or a person? There's, there's several different structures for cover letters. And if you go on the internet, there's a there's tremendous amounts of different styles that people use. I like the three to five sentence format blocks of three sections, who you are, what you do, uh, example of a really big area you've worked in and a determination, you know, like what you've done in that area. And then, you know, why you're a good candidate. That's the way that I normally like to structure my cover letters or hit them in the beginning. You need to hire me because I can do this for your company. And the only reason you would know that you can do that for the company because you already researched the company and you knew what they need. So for example, there's a technology company that I know, I know they're doing digital payments. I know that their digital payments platform has an issue with determining who are the customers that are on the platform. I know it because it got leaked. So if I was writing a cover letter to them, I'm going, I'm going to say in my cover letter, I have created systematic approaches to XYZ that covers digital payments. First line. So whoever's reading that, they're going to know, well, okay. <laughs> he actually does what we need. That's the line that's going to capture the person's attention. It's about all catching the person's attention. And I want to catch their attention as quickly as possible. Because remember, they're going to be reading several different cover letters. You want to stand out. So you want to get to the point. So whatever the need is of the company that you know you can fill, put it, in the, put it right in their face, immediately in the front. Okay. This next set of questions, they kind of all go together. So I'm just going to ask them together. Um, so what if the interviews don't go as you hoped? Um, for example, the team, you know, the collaboration is not there. You learn that the collaboration is not there or the hiring manager is not going to give you time for 10 questions. How do you manage that at that moment? Or do you just take that as research for whether or not you want to go on in the interview process? Be flexible. If you know that they say you only got five minutes, you know the most important questions you need to hit. If they say that this is not gonna go like this, then you adjust. Just ad adjust and adapt yourself to the environment to show that you're fluid. Show them that you're a professional and you can take multiple challenges at any point from any area when you're in that room. So you got 10 questions, you can only ask two, you know which two you're going with. You just adjust yourself. You don't tell them, wait, wait, hold on. I got 10 questions, so we're not finished yet. You don't do that. <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> you need to adapt to the environment that you're in, and you need to adapt strategically. And I told a person once, if I go into an interview and they tell me two people and 50 show up, bring it. I'm ready because I know my stuff. Well, I know a little bit of my stuff. I know some of my, I might, I might be able to wing it. <laughs> But the point is, I'm going to adapt. And you have to try to, the more you practice having these, that's why having the conversations and the virtual meetings and the 10 or 15 minute conversation is going to allow you to build that skill set. You know, you can be very shy and build that skill set. You can be very loud and learn how to tone it down when it's necessary. So the more people you interact with and the more conversations you have, the more you'll start to sense yourself and your space and how you can adapt really quickly. So my okay. thing is adapt, be adaptable. And if they throw you on the floor immediately, like here's an issue, can you look at it? You'll be like, sure, give it to me. That's the kind of person that some people want to see on their team. Because if, you, if you're really good at what you do or you're pretty good at what you do, you're gonna have that sense of confidence and people are gonna look for that kind of confidence because when the sky starts falling, they want people that can handle it. Yep, and, it's, and it falls in all industries, it falls. Um, Randy, you segue into an event that we're gonna, we're gonna be having in November. 
where we're going to invite graduating seniors or graduating master students and new recent alums to come do mock interviews with alums who are in their in a good place and able to do this with HR people, you know, folks like yourself. I'll send you the info in case you're available. And they'll be in a breakout room. Let's say Randy's in a breakout room and I'll be in the breakout room with him. He'll interview me for 15 minutes and then the last 15 the last five minutes he'll give me feedback. So I think that's something that may be of interest to folks in this session because we talked a lot about this plan, this job search plan and this career and job transformation. So in the calendar that Megan sent out, make sure you sign up for that event if you really want to practice because you're going to get excellent feedback. We're not going to tell you what you want to hear. We're going to tell you what you need to hear so that you can go and get the job. Um, and so I highly recommend that. So thank you for that because I think this kind of drives the point home that you have to be prepared, you have to adapt, but you also have to practice right? Just like anything else. Interviewing is tough. Interviewing can be intimidating. So you have to practice. And what better way to do it than in a safe space with your alumni network? So, you know, that's coming up. And then there's one, I'm going to give you this one last question. It's very specific. And it has to do with what you do because you have the CAMS certification. Um, do you recommend folks get certifications like that one? without experience to add on to their credentials or should people be getting experience and then looking to see what certificates look good for what they're doing? I would say twofold. One, if the firm is going to pay for it, definitely get it because all firms, most firms sponsor you to get it. So they'll pay for you to get the certification. And in some fields I've noticed that if you have the certification, it helps you get through the door faster. So some feels it's worth it to get the certification in advance to get you through the door. But I've seen people who have certifications that told me they had difficulty getting a position. And normally the reason why is that they had no experience. So they passed the, they passed the certification, but they had no experience. But I've also always said that that's an asset on like a person who's just going in for the position who has no experience and has no certification either. So it's a cost issue. So if you have the ability and the means to afford it, I say yes, because it differentiates you in the marketplace. If you can't afford it, I say go get the experience in a get into a bank, get into a private equity firm, get into a head, whatever firm it is that you are gonna work with and then let them sponsor you for that particular certification. Any certifications that the firm that you're going to be working for is willing to pay for, I always say acquire it once it's strategic in your career path. Some things are required, some things are optional, but I think it does make it. I've realized that even me having a law degree and then studying for CAMS, I was like, whoa, this is a lot of work in a short space of time. So it two months of studying for it and then taking the exam, I was like, okay, I thought, I knew my stuff, but I was like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff I did not know. Especially with the international organizations related to AML and stuff like that. So it is a definitely an asset, but you got to use the asset for what you know you're going to want to do. And I, I like to deal with companies that have issues globally. I like the issues that are, big dollar amounts in really complex bad situations because then I can really dive into whatever the issue is and understand how did we get here what caused it but also how do we make sure it doesn't happen again that's what I like to do so when you're going to do the certif certification those are the kind of things I recommend well Randy I don't know what to say I almost feel like I need to get my stuff together and I'm not even looking for a job. So thank this you. This made me realize I need to do some more stuff on my <laughs> own stuff. Exactly. This is a, a cycle that doesn't stop. I had a mentor once who told me, you're never not looking for a job. You're always looking to see what, especially if you're ambitious, you always want to see what the next opportunity is. Um, so with that said, I want everyone to give Randy a huge virtual round of applause. 
He gave us an extra 15 minutes of his time. And he is a John Jay alum. He is who you are or who you will be if you are a student. And so you see the caliber of our alumni network. And this is eventually, I want all of you to be able to do a webinar because your caliber and your expertise is so high. So I just need you to give me that call when you're ready. And so Randy, thank you so very much. This was excellent. I think everyone at all levels learned a great deal this evening and everybody wants the recording because we got to write those questions down. Thank you again. And if, I don't know if you have any, a few final words, be my guest. Oh, or, I was going to tell you, thank you so much for having yeah. me. It was a pleasure to be here, Roseanne. It was great connecting you. with you. John Jay had an alumni event on a rooftop, which I love in the summertime. And that's where we connected. And, yeah. you know, it came to us connecting and doing something like this to help everyone out. And I hope the information I gave you was really um, helpful for your career transformation. And I am going to also send Rosanna a link because the firm that I work for, um, we have, we're hiring summer interns and our internship programs are paid. So I'll be sending Rosanna the information with regard to that so she can share with you guys. But as I said, you know, I want you guys to have your documents. I want you guys to have your information. I want you guys to be positioned in a certain way because I don't ever want to put somebody up to do something that I know I'm not going to be putting up to be the best that they are. I want you to be the best that you are. So I want you to excel and I want you to shine. That's right. And we have a three-day weekend coming up. So one day for each of these three-day transformations, you have uh, Columbus Day on the 12th. So that gives you Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And you know, if you're not going to do it sooner, that's an open spot on your calendar, hopefully. So again, Randy, thank you. Thank you to all of our participants and audience members. You could have been anywhere this evening and you chose to be with us for a little over an hour. And we are very appreciative to that. And we always wanna be of service to our alumni and future alumni. So with that, please be safe and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Bye. Bye.